So far in this series, we've focused a lot on the theory side of vibration. We've looked at the five characteristics of vibration, which were frequency, acceleration, velocity, displacement, and phase. We looked at what these characteristics can tell us and how to use FFTs and time waveforms to identify and predict time, timelines of the machine's condition and degradation. But now it's time to turn to looking at the hardware we use to record and analyze vibration data. Paul's in the shop this week to give us a rundown on the data collector settings and what goes into the setup of the data collector. Okay, so what we have here is an actual instrument that we would use in vibration. Unfortunately, this instrument is somewhat obsolete now. This is called a CSI 2130 Computational Systems International is one type of box that we use. There's all kinds of different manufacturers, but you're going to find in the business that this one here is the most widely used one. It's uh, generally accepted as the best piece of equipment, and so generally we use this uh, CSI. Uh, nowadays, this is up to a 2150. So basically the entire box is the same, works the same, except the 2150 has Wi-Fi on it. This one doesn't, and so for your Wi-Fi, you're spending about another $50,000, just to, so you get this box here to buy this box new, probably the box itself new, about $50,000. Then the program software, all the instruments that go with this box, probably another $50,000. So about $100,000 to set up with one of these pieces of equipment. Thing to remember in vibration is you make one call. One call can save $100,000 easily in one of these huge operations and that. So initial investment is high, but the payback is really high on this piece of equipment. So well worth the investment. We have to remember that the data collector isn't an expense. Uh, it's just a tool that we use to maximize the efficiency of our program. It's fundamental to the planning and direction of millions of dollars in resources that our maintenance program is allocating. So now that we have the box, what's the first setting? Um, what's the setting on there that we're going to have to look at setting? So the first thing that we have to do before we go and take a reading is we have to set the box up. Or what we have to do is if, you, if you're if you old like me and remember a 35 millimeter camera back in the day, set the cameras on your phone, which you use now. 35 millimeter camera, you used to have to set up the F-Max. So that's how fast the shutter speed clicks. You had to uh, uh, set up also like the picture, how big it was and all kinds of different things. So basically this box is the same way. We have to set this box up to take a reading. So the first thing that we're going to do is in the box, we can see here, and it says F max, F min, and lines of resolution. So the first thing, if I press the button here, and it says uh, set the analyze mode. So we see our F max, our F min, and our lines of resolution. So if you go follow me over to the board here, I'm going to make our spectrum. And so when we're setting the F max, where the F min means zero. So what we're doing is we're setting the span of our spectrum. And the reason we do that is because certain faults happen at certain areas on the spectrum. High frequency faults, early bearing, stuff like that happens out here on the spectrum. Imbalance, things that are uh, related to turning speed happen on the left side of the spectrum. So what we can do is we can segment this up and we can set the F max at anything we want. So say if I only want to look at high frequency energy, so I might set this at 50,000 CPM up to 100,000 CPM or whatever. I can look anywhere I want. So on the box, what it says is the F min is zero. So that means zero. It says the F max is 24,000 Hertz. So the window, 24,000 Hertz. Hertz are cycles per second. So you want to change Hertz from cycles per second to cycles per minute, multiply by 60. You want to change it from cycles per minute back to Hertz, you divide by 60. So what we're doing is we're setting up the window of what we want to see. So we can set the F min and F max or the range of frequency our fast Fourier transform will calculate. What goes into the decision of selecting that range? How do we decide what the F min, F max would actually be? So whatever faults we want to zero in on dictates how we set up our window. If we want to look at all the information in the spectrum, then we go from zero out to whatever we need here. And so what we'll do is what we do is we take the, uh, the primary frequency, whatever fault we're looking at, and generally we multiply that by three. So if a gear mesh frequency was 10,000 hertz, 
then what we would do is set this window up at 30,000 hertz, just a little bit more, because what we want to do is see three harmonics of that primary frequency in this F-max picture here. The next setting Paul mentioned after F-min and F-max was lines. Let's learn a little bit more about lines of resolution. So if you look on the box, lines of resolution. So basically right down here, it has lines. So 400 lines. So basically what we do when we're setting the lines of resolution is how clear the picture is. The more lines of resolution, the clearer the picture is. So the box will look at 400 lines of resolution, 800 lines of resolution, 1600 lines of resolution, 3200 lines of resolution, 6400 lines of resolution, and 12800 lines of resolution. So you can't set it to any number, but it's a doubling, so you double 400 to 800, double 800 to 16, double 16 to 32. And what that means is how we set the picture. So 400 lines of resolution might divide the spectrum up like this, okay? So 400 lines. It's gonna give you wider spaces between, as if we had 30, divided the spectrum up into 3,200 lines, then we'd have something like this. And so what it does is it segments up the spectrum, more lines of resolution, the clearer the picture you have. And so some faults that we look at, we want to have a really clear picture. And so what I mean by clear picture is, is that if we have a fault and we have 400 lines of resolution, so take for instance a gear mesh. So a gear mesh would happen over here. Okay, at 400 lines of resolution, the gear mesh would look like this. Be a peak that would go up and kind of come down like that. And so in the peak, you got this great big space in the bottom here. So we got one line here, one line of resolution here. Everything in between those two lines would come up. You'd have a peak like this. If you switch this now instead of 400 lines, and let's just pick something, oh, not 4,000, 400. Let's pick some. let's go 3,200 lines or 64. Let's say we set it at 6,400 lines of resolution. Now what you have instead of lines, this much part, you have all these lines, more lines of resolution. So instead of having a picture that looks like this where your peak is really wide, what's happening at 400 is you're missing everything that's going on in here because it's fallen. What the box does is it binds it up into lines. And so the lines are like bins. So to go from zero to 10 CPM, and you, you put it in here from 10 to 20 CPM, put it in here from 20 to 30 CPM and put it. So each one of these lines that deposit are, we call them bins, and it puts the information into the bin and then the computer makes the picture out of that. So at less lines, 400, we look at a gear mesh would look like this. Right? We can't really do much diagnosis on gear mesh with that. We can get the gear mesh frequency to be here, but the thing with gear mesh is that we look at how many sidebands are around that primary function, and sideband is a way to tell the severity of a problem. So at 30 or 6,400 lines, this now turns into something that looks like this. There's your primary gear mesh frequency, and now you get these little lines around it that you wouldn't see. The old picture would have went like this, and all this information in here you missed, okay? And so what the sidebands tell you in a gear mesh is that what we'll do is we'll measure from the primary over to a sideband, and generally this sideband will correspond with the turning speed of the bad gear. So if we had a gear with it was eccentric, it would come up at the turning speed of that gear. If we had a gear with a bad tooth, it would show up in these sidebands. So the clearer, the more lines of resolution you have, the clearer the picture is. And so when you're doing really precise work, when very, very, uh, looking for very small frequency ranges, you have to have more lines of resolution. Turns that picture at 32, now I can do all kinds of analysis in here. I can look at these sidebands. Generally, the more sidebands there are around, the, the more severe the problem is. So the other way, at 400 lines, I just see this, I can do any of this analysis in here. So the more lines in the picture, the clearer the picture is. Same as if you set your F-Max in your camera or whatever, same thing. So that's basically when we're setting up the box, we've got to set up the F-Max, 
how far the spectrum goes, the F min, the bottom end of the spectrum, and how many lines of resolution. So now we've set up our picture to take our shot. Some things uh, in balance or something like that, low turning stuff, you can probably get away with 400 lines. But when you're doing high frequency, high resolution pictures, you're gonna have to use 6,400 lines. So you can switch the box around to whatever you need. So my question is, why would you ever use 400 lines instead of 6,400 lines or something higher than that? It seems like more resolution is a good thing. So in the old days, back when the boxes, wasn't much computing power in the boxes and all that kind of stuff. We know how things, you get more power in this little phone now that we used to have in the computer as big as this room, right? Same thing with the instruments as they've got better over time. And so what used to limit it was the more lines of resolution, the longer it took to take your shot. So I said at the mill, we had 15,000 points a month to look at. Well, we would set it down so that we could have time to do it or it would be quicker. Nowadays, the computing power is so good that you can have any lines of resolution here. It takes the picture like that. So generally what we do now is we'll leave it at 64. We'll leave it at, uh, we generally leave it at 1280 or 12800, the highest resolution and just leave it there. But in the old days, it used to be time was a major consideration. But now, so nowadays, this really doesn't come into as much. We'll set it at very high resolution and then it can take the time. Yeah, that explanation makes perfect sense. Um, let's see maybe some of the other settings that we have that goes into the setup of the data collector. I saw that there was a lot more options there. If I just kind of go back here, as we can see averages here. So it says normal averages here, and it has D, uh, peak view and demodulation. Peak view and demodulation are very high frequency readings. So they're way out on the right side of the spectrum. So certain early bearing gear mesh, something like that, we would use peak view to do our analysis to very high frequency, very high resolution shot. So we could set it up like that. Also, when the box takes a reading, it averages. So we have the box set here, three averages. So basically what the box is doing is taking three readings, reading, 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 takes the average of them. And the reason we do that is to eliminate something we call transient events from the reading. So I'm taking my reading with my accelerometer and the forklift drives behind me for a second or something else happens. So there's some kind of vibration in there that's not related to the shot I'm taking. So what the averages does is it eliminates that. It takes three, takes an average. So if there's any event like a shock or something while I'm taking my reading, it'll basically average that out of the equation, I guess, is for lack of a better term. Trigger level here is just basically what we set. How many Gs? So 0 0.01 Gs, very, very low, triggers, triggers the instrument so it'll work. Auto ranging on is the same as averaging. So auto ranging, you set it up to auto range five times or whatever, it just automatically takes averages. The more averages you take, with the thing and average is just taking more readings and average than the more accurate the shot is. So it gets away all those. The window here is a uniform window. So what the window is in vibration is basically what happens with the window is that it averages the shirt. So every average, it takes a new window. And so some windows on the box, kind of like so, well, move like this so anything on the outside of the shot doesn't take very well some windows kind of go like this across here so it takes a better average so for different different types of readings different types of shot you have to set up a different window i don't want to confuse you guys windows is like in level three of vibration okay but i just want you to know there's a hanning window it's called hanning there's a uniform window so there's different windows that we put in here. And basically the window is just like a window in your house, sets it up that we're looking through the window. And what it does is basically the thing, every average, it has a window for one average, a window for the next average, a window for the next average. And so basically when it makes the waveform, there's one window, two windows, three windows, four windows. So it helps with the way the box averages, so with the different types of windows. So basically, just for a really down and dirty explanation, I could sit here and talk about windows for a week if I wanted to, and I'm sure nobody wants to hear that, so.
Okay, just the windows away we set up her box to take a shot. So basically that's the box in itself. So we would have to set up her box. Also down here it has input A. So on a box here we have input A and we have input B. And the reason we have that is remember when we take a phase reading, then what we'll do is we'll have two accelerometers on the box. One accelerometer going to the pump, one accelerometer going to the motor, and then we can do and take a phase reading. So we have to uh, tell it input A is in G's. So with G's, what do we measure in G's? Acceleration, so the box is set in acceler. We can set it to input A, displacement, inches per second, millimeters per second, or we can set window A to displacement where we'd be looking at mills. So if I was balancing with this box, I would set it the input A to displacement where I'd be measuring in mills. So we can change the box around for different things. There's all kinds of different uh, tack setup how we set our tack up here, how many seconds, there's all kinds, trigger level, what triggers the tack. There's, I mean, we could go on here for a month of all the different things that set your window up, whether it's a uniform or a handing window, all these different things before you set your shot up. So basically when vibration, when you do level one for certification, you're the person that goes out and collects the data. You're not responsible to set the box up. That's a level two or level three would set the box up. You go out, collect the data, bring it back, and somebody else analyze it. Once you get to level two, now you're starting to set the box up yourself, going out to collect the data, but you're also starting to analyze the data. Level three, basically you're analyzing data. Level four, you're next thing to God. So that's pretty much the way that works. <laughs> basically what you do is you write your exam, usually in a hotel, and then after you finish the exam, they bring you down. If you can walk across the hotel pool without sinking into it, you get your level four.